everyone welcome to our uh, lesson number nine in the series about Psalms 119 the psalm of the word I hope that you found uh, the preceding lessons presented by different uh, people men with the Woodlands Church of Christ here and we'll be continuing this series through the end of the summer I hope that you'll continue to uh, log in and check in with us and keep following along as we finish this great psalm. Tonight our assignment is verses 113 through the end of verse 128. Again, we're taking uh, two paragraphs or two sections um, separated in the Psalm 119 that is divided by the Hebrew alphabet. And so we're taking the section that begins verse 113 and the section that begins verse 121. I'm going to read the text in its entirety first tonight and then um, proceed to talk about the text. But I want you to remember that the challenges that believers face in every culture, in every generation, are really the same. And consequently, it should help us to appreciate that the solutions to those difficulties, no matter the culture, no matter the generation, remain the same. And in this psalmist's great treatise, uh, it's actually poetry, but on the greatness of the Word of God, we're going to come back and recognize as we read through this particular section tonight, 
on that great value of the word. So read with me beginning verse 113. I hate those who are double-minded, but I love thy law. Thou art my hiding place and my shield, I wait for thy word. Depart from me, evildoers, that I may observe the commandments of my God. Sustain me according to your word that I may live, and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Uphold me, that I may be safe, that I may have regard for thy statutes continually, that thou hast rejected all those who wander from thy statutes, for their deceitfulness is useless. Thou hast removed all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. The first section is summarily describing the psalmist's um, belief that in God's word he's safe, that there he finds hope, there he finds trust, uh, and there he believes God will sustain him, verse 116, in verse 117, uphold him. But notice what the psalmist says about himself first. He says in verse 113, I hate those who are double-minded. I love your law. In verse 114, the New American Standard says, I wait um, for thy word. Other translations say, I hope for thy word. <clears throat> so let's talk about this hate. Christians are not supposed to hate, and that's true, but the word hate doesn't have to convey the uh, demonic evil that we associate sometimes with the word evil. The word evil could mean something that um, uh, this, I'm sorry, this hate could signify something, something I love less, and that's one way certainly to look at it. But the idea of hate here is despising and the King James uses the translation of thoughts I, I despise those thoughts that are uneven but here the New American Standard says I hate those it's a person who are double-minded now remember already in the psalm he's talked about uh, the arrogant he's talked about his enemies and even here uh, in the he's gonna describe them verse 115 as evildoers and then he's going to describe them uh, in verse uh, 122 as the arrogant and then again in verse 126 as those who break your law so it's clearly defining who this audience is it's not so much a a person as much as it is a type of person those who break your law the arrogant um, and in this case, he calls them in an American standard the double-minded. One uh, translator or commentator named Kidner made the connection to this word in First Corinthians, First Kings, chapter eighteen, verse twenty-one, where uh, the prophet describes the unequalness of someone's walk. That uh, you're kind of hobbling. You have to decide where you're going to stand. You can't stand on this foot. You can't stand on that foot. You have to stand up and be what you are. Stand up for God and be what you are. And so what he's describing then, I think, is the kind of person who doesn't ally himself with God's word. That is the double-minded, the person who is uneven in his ways, who is arrogant because they believe they know the way and in their arrogance, they break God's law. So these two paragraphs together, that seems to me the, the people that he has in mind when he describes hating them, that he loves them less. He, he, doesn't, try, he doesn't ally himself with them. He does not love them. Uh, but rather, he loves those who will love God's law. And the reason that is the case, he says, because I love your law. Then in verse 114, he says, God, you are my hiding place and my shield. And that will be his petition in this section of the psalm. Sustain me, verse 116, uphold me, because you are my shield and you are my shepherd. And he says in other parts of the psalm, 
and particularly here, you are my hiding place. You are my um, safe room that when we have to live in a world where um, maybe evil is glorified or where people around us find no um, harm in being uh, non-followers of the Word of God, even when they may even profess that they have faith in God, but they will not follow God's instructions, the attitude of the psalmist should be ours, that God, you are my safe place. Your, your word is my safe place. I don't argue with people because I'm right. I stay with where I am because I know your word is right. And so notice there is a, a non-aggressiveness to this behavior in the psalmist because he's passively accepting that God is going to be his safe place. So then in verse 115, then the statement made, depart from me evildoers that I may observe the commandments of my God. Go away from me. Remove your influence from me. Depart from me. Certainly the psalmist doesn't mean that uh, let me cower myself in the dark corner of the world so that I will never ever be um, around evil. Let me sequester myself from life so that I can live a life of, of just the way I want to. That might still, especially in times of 2020, that certainly could be something that we could engender in ourselves. This, I just wish I could go to a place in Montana, <laughs> for all those who might be in Montana watching, um, where there's no one around me and I don't have to worry about all the awful things that seem to be happening around me. But the psalmist's statement, depart from me, says, I do not want you evildoers around me. That is, I don't want to be influenced because I love your law. And so notice that it is the psalmist who makes the decision about the influences that will come into his life. He, he decides that I'm not going to have evildoers around me, that I'm going to yield myself to the authority of the word, and I'm going to yield myself to the authority of that word because I love the law, and because I know it will sustain me, verse 116, and uphold me. Notice he, he does say, verse 116, and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Already in verse 43 of this psalm, verse 49, verse 74, verse 81, and even in verse 114, in describing I wait for thy word, or I hope for thy word, if that's the correct translation. Still in verse 116, don't let me be ashamed of my hope. Don't And notice, it is certainly not be ashamed of God, but here specifically the revealing of God in his word is what the psalmist says he does not want to be ashamed of. So apply that in your life. Are, are you ashamed of what God says? Are you ashamed of, of what the teaching of God is? When we come to a realization that we're acting ashamed, instead of maybe consciously recognizing our shame, but, but acting in a way as if we're ashamed to let people know we read the Word of God or, or to talk about what the Word of God is. Maybe the Word of God at times makes us uncomfortable because there are things in it that reveal our own unrighteousness. It may reveal in others that we love an unrighteousness. But I, I want you to, to recognize that um, what we're talking about here has to do with the um, importance of this. I'm going to do a quick check if you don't mind because it looks like to me something's going on with my camera. I'm going to double check it real quick. Okay, I'm back. Don't know really what it was, um, but thank you for hanging on there during that little black circle there. Um, or black square, whatever it was in front of you. So then we finish this section beginning in verse eight, 118 by saying, um, 
Thou hast rejected all those who wander from your statutes, for their deceitfulness is useless. Thou hast removed all the wickedness of the earth like dross, therefore I love your testimonies. And notice um, the two parallels of the beginning of both of those verses that he describes those who wander, I'm sorry, um, that the second part of those verses, that their deceitfulness is useless and that thou hast removed all the wicked of the earth like dross. Um, dross was a word describing the material that was left on the surface of um, an element like iron or any other kind of precious commodity that would be um, uh, purified to remove the impurities and then that film or whatever formed uh, one uh, person as I read about describing it used the word scum the scum that formed um, after the processes of this refining would be wiped away and thrown away and so notice he says thou hast removed all the wicked of the earth like dross so, you know you've you've put the earth through this fire and the wicked are like the dross they are um, the scum, the film, the leftover of all of this process and they will be cast aside, that, that they're useless. It isn't that they're unimportant human beings. Jesus Christ died for all the earth. It, it isn't that they aren't people to be loved. They are. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So it isn't a question of their value. It's a question of what their lives have been used and how useful they really are. If they pursued a life of selfishness and of sin and of unrighteousness, they they prove themselves to be self-centered and useless to the cause of God in helping community belong together and unite together. And so the psalmist says, um, I rejoice in who you are, for you have rejected all those who wander from your statutes their deceitfulness is useless, and thou hast removed all the wicked of the earth like dross. Perhaps it is futuristic in that he's describing the final day, but more than likely it seems the psalmist is describing the providential act of God. Works that we don't see necessarily transforming before our eyes, because that's what providence is. It's God working behind the curtain, if you will, of the visual reality that we see. <clears throat> But instead, this psalmist understands that behind that curtain, God is accomplishing his purpose. And that's why he says, therefore, I love your testimonies. You have testified about what your work is, God. You have testified about your righteousness. And you have testified about the judgment you will bring to the wicked. So I will continue to take my refuge in your word. I will continue to be sustained and upheld by what your teaching is because I love your law. Then the last verse of the section concludes with my flesh trembles. So there is a, a reverential fear on the part of the psalmist to understand who this God is in whom he has put his trust, who this God is that is upholding him and sustaining him and is his refuge and his uh, shield. The word becomes synonymous to describe the word giver God himself and he says and I am afraid of your judgments the reason that the psalmist has come to trust God so profoundly is because the psalmist knows God's judicial character and that is the perfect balance and the perfect picture of God to appreciate the love and the mercy of God and the justness of God and his wrath. Behold the goodness and severity of God, Paul described in his picturing of Romans 9 through 11, how God was still accomplishing his purpose through the nation of Israel. And so this Israelite has a well-balanced view to see that God, I love your law, but I, I still know who you really are. And then as he moves from his uh, pronounce safety in the word that is God's. He moves on to say in verse 121, I have done justice and righteousness. 
Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for the servant, your servant, for good. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes fail with longing for your salvation and for your righteous word. Deal with thy servant according to thy loving kindness and teach me thy statutes. I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act, for they have broken thy law. Therefore I love your commandments above gold, yes, above fine gold. Therefore I esteem right all thy precepts concerning everything, and I hate every false way. So this last section, 121 and onward, is a prayer or uh, and certainly it, it's a, a song but but it, it it is a petition for God to act when he says Lord it's time for you to act in verse 126 and he keeps saying thy the your and and so there is this clarity that the psalmist is petitioning God in a direct and 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 uh, and, and uh, personal way. So how does the psalmist view himself? Well, in the course of four verses, three times, he calls himself God's servant. That's verse 122, uh, 122 be surety for your servant. Verse 124, deal with your servant. Verse 125, I am my servant. And so the psalmist knew who he was. And, and what is it about being God's servant? Well, verse 124, God dealt with him. <laughs> and and that, that's prompted by the psalmist's understanding that God is a righteous God. Verse 120, my flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. I know who you are, and I know the righteousness of your law. Therefore, he says, deal with your servant. But he says, deal with your servant according to loving kindness. The, the faithfulness of his uh, character to the covenant God had made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and would make to David, and, and would continue on to the nation until Jesus would come. That faithfulness um, is to the sky. And God will always be faithful. And so that's the petition of the psalmist. Deal with your servant according to your loving kindness. Don't just excuse me, but mercifully pardon me. And verse 124, teach me thy statutes. Don't allow me to just get a get out of jail free card but rather make me be taught in the uh, transgression of my life than in the transmission of God's mercy to him. He would learn again the righteousness of God and see again the righteous way. So then he says in verse 121, uh, I didn't intend to ignore that, but he says, I've done justice and righteousness. I've done it. And in, I guess some might perceive that that's the description of someone who's self-righteous. You know, well, I've done everything um, from childhood. I've kept every commandment, uh, the rich man told Jesus. And <clears throat> we can quickly think that uh, someone who makes such an attestation about their character would certainly be self-righteous. Well, I'm not sure that that's always the case. Because in, in moments of, of great sorrow or great fear or overwhelmed with tragedy, it isn't a big surprise that someone would tell God, like Job did himself in Job 17, verse 3, look at me. And, and it's not like Job was innocent of all wrongdoing, but in comparison to those around him, Job was innocent. Or he was innocent of the thing certainly being uh, he was being accused of and so the psalmist here I think has that same heart of Job that the those who have oppressed him the prideful the arrogant who uh, 
need their judgment brought upon him. That they, they they have they have shown who they are, and and the psalmist says, "I'm not like them. I have done justice and righteousness. So do not leave me to my oppressors. Lord, be my surety. Stand up for me, and and defend me." For this, for thy servant, for good. Don't let your uh, uh, arrogant oppress me. So that that makes me feel the psalmist is shouting out with the inequities of life, like a Job would, about how the oppressed is being oppressed by the arrogant, and how the oppressed is calling out to God, "I haven't been evil." So. You may not necessarily agree with that read on the text, but I, I think that is the meaning of the psalmist. Then he says in verse 127, So I love your commandments. Um, above gold, yes, above fine gold. This is the psalmist's heart about what he thinks of God's law. And finally he says, Therefore I esteem right all your precepts concerning everything. God, if it comes from your mouth, I believe it. Uh, God, if it comes from your mouth, it must be the right way. God, if that's what you have said, it is something I must believe. That is the, that's a heart of faith on the part of the psalmist, not the heart of arrogance or self-righteousness. It's recognizing that everything the Lord has said is right and good. And, and certainly that should be your attitude and mine that when we read what God has ordained for the world and ordained for us and, and what it is that we should be, if the Lord says it, that's enough. But our struggle with the temptation that the devil presents is that like Adam and Eve, we're always arguing with God. We're always saying, well, no, God, you need to understand me better. You, no, God, it doesn't really apply. No, God. But the psalmist says, I know, Lord, that everything you've said is true. Deal with your servant according to your loving kindness. I, I, I have, as he says, done justice and righteousness. But the psalmist doesn't say, I'm perfect. The psalmist doesn't say, I'm flawless. Um, the psalmist doesn't say, Lord, I deserve your presence. The psalmist is still on bended knee and still acknowledging in humility with faith his absolute trust that the word of God will be his protection. And so he says, because I esteem all right, all your precepts concerning everything, I hate every false way. So as a Christian, there are many false things in our world to hate. And notice he uses that word hate again. Because loving the thing that God hates shouldn't be part of our makeup. So when you come to realize there are things that God hates in our society, don't wrap your heart around it. Turn away from it. Recognize that the psalmist knew, and you should know like I should know, that if it comes from the word of God and it comes from his mouth, it is holy and just and good. And what God condemns, I should condemn. What God, what God rejoices in, I should rejoice in. But the psalmist's heart of humility before God, because of his trust in the word, is what's going to be the thing that's going to sustain us. It's going to be the thing that upholds us. And God will stand with us. He will be there with us. He will be our um, surety, verse 122. And as your eyes are longing for his salvation, and as your eyes are searching for his righteous word, God will be there. And that's a comforting assurance. In a world where we're surrounded with darkness, there are things all around us that we wish weren't happening. Maybe we can make a difference by speaking out against the evil. We can make a difference in a culture that has voting, that we can cast a vote. But you're going to make a difference 
if you'll have this attitude of the psalmist and hate every false way, and I don't just mean the ways that you think are false, but every false way that God calls false, and speak out against those evils, even when your family and your brothers Heaven forbid that it's your brothers in Christ or even your fellow countrymen disagree with you on. I love your law and let the law be loved by you. Thank you for joining us. We'll continue our study of Psalm 119 next week. May God bless you.